Hey, welcome. How's it going? Thanks for coming. Yeah. I'm excited. How have you been? Yeah. Nick's about to install his Bill Ted show. Okay. Uh, legendary Enid Oklahoma artist. And, uh, and then you're going to do Nicole and uh, photography show? Um, I, yeah, I was going to be in it, but I, I'm not going to be doing the show you said. Yeah, yeah, so that's okay. December, Yeah, there's beer, water. <laughs> we literally were like, so we just have to do it. Yeah, yeah. You don't need to do that. <laughs> We're going to get started in about five minutes.
Nick doesn't want to plug it, but Saturday there's oh. opening. Oh, We're having an opening for Bill Thud yes. from 5 to 8 p.m. Under recognized old time Oklahoma artist. Everyone should come. It's going to be fun. But for now, we have Eli Grayson for a, a history of the freedmen of Indian Territory. Um, let's give you a big round of applause. Woo! Oh! Woo! I'm gonna use this because I have an allergies. They were so bad that I went and had a COVID test. And they told me, get your ass up, you have allergies and you have COVID. <laughs> so. well, yeah, I think. Yeah. Uh, my name is Eli Grayson. I am a Muskogee citizen. Uh, my ancestry here in Tennessee dates back to the 1820s before the Indian War. There was a faction of Creeks and Choctaws, Chick Chickasaws, who had left the South because of an act of a tribal chief named William McIntosh, who sold our lands in Georgia illegally to his uncle, who happened to be governor of the state. <laughs> and he was one of our tribal chiefs. And our tribal council had collectively said to any of the Mikos, which means chiefs, um, that if you do that, if you sell an acre, you're dead. He did so. And soon after, he was dead. <laughs> they got him. But in the meantime, uh, a lot of the uh, wealthier Creek families uh, decided to pack up and leave because they felt threatened that this had happened. And my family happened to be one of those groups of people. And they left in the 1820s and arrived here uh, where the three rivers are, the Three Rivers and the Arkansas and so forth, which is the beginning of Creek history here in Indian Territory. And mind you that the Removal Act was in 1830. The Removal Treaty was in 1832. So uh, it was later on in the 1830s all the way up until the 1840s that the removal period lasted two decades. And the Creeks, um, historically, are many different tribes. There's really no such thing as the Creek Nation until recently. Before that, you were a member of a tribe that was part of the Confederacy. My people uh, were ufology. The town of Ufala is actually named for them, but that's not them. It was a band of Indians called the Ufology. And you had the Kawitas, the uh, Ofuskis, um, the Tuskegees, all different bands of Creeks, the Kawitas, uh, Broken Arrows, that made up the Confederacy of the Creek Nation. Unlike other tribes, 
the Creek and the Seminole Nation were many bands of tribes, unlike the other three tribes of the five so-called civilized tribes. Um, my people were Kuwitas, Ufologies, Fijiris, Ketchupadagas, and go on down the list of who they were uh, when they came down here. Also, if you live in Tulsa, I'm sure you've heard of the Loja Boja in the Council Oak Tree with the Loja people. And Loja in Creek just means turtle. It's basically the turtle people. And what had happened is for them, uh, they wanted to go far north into the tribal nation. And this is how crazy Tulsa is. Tulsa sits geographically, initially on two tribal nations' boundaries. And then after the Civil War, it became three nations because the Osages were added. But Tulsa itself, to the northwest, is the Osage Nation. To the northeast is the Cherokee Nation. To the south is the Muscogee Creek Nation. And the boundary for that is Admiral. If you're on the north side of Admiral, you're in the Cherokee Nation. If you're on the south side of Admiral, you're in the Muscogee Nation. If you're on the west side of Union, north of Edison, you're in the Osage Nation. But south of Edison, you're in the Muscogee Nation. And so when you know where the Council Oak Tree is, you're just about a mile south of the Cherokee Nation. And back in the 1830s, when the Loja were landed, that, that was as far as they can go. They got dumped off. We can't take you any farther because you're going to be in the Cherokee Nation. So that's basically how they really ended up there. And that spot, the riverboats couldn't go any farther without literally going into another tribe's domain. And the Loja people would have had no rights there. So. Uh, we're going to talk about the Freeman, but I want to give you a little background on understanding uh, what an Indian is, because we have a lot of questions about that. We have what we call the indigenous people of the Western Hemisphere, and then we have something that the federal courts and Congress declares as American Indian, two different animals there. And the reason is that most people from Mexico and South America and the Central America, they're indigenous, but they're not considered American Indian because it's a legal term. When we talk about American Indians, we're talking about a political status, not a race status. It's like there's no such thing as the Cherokee race of people. There's no such thing as the Muscogee race of people. You know, or the Navajo race of people. Their political status, just like being a Canadian, or a Japanese, or somebody from Great Britain. When you're Cherokee, it's a political status. That's why the Cherokee Nation has treaties with the U.S. because the U.S. never signed treaties with races. It signed treaties with other countries, other nations. And these political status of these, of what we, classified as Indian, and you can look it up. Um, I think it was a Supreme Court ruling in 1970, 71, called Martin versus Mankari. And the question was, it was basically, there was a complaint that jobs in the BIA were only going to Native people and not white people. And so there was a lawsuit brought by uh, there was a white guy in the BIA saying he was being looked over because Indian people were getting the jobs and he wasn't. And so the court was asked to define who is Indian. Is it a race? Is it a political status? Why give this person this job if you can't discriminate based on race? And so the Supreme Court said a Indian, and this is very important in this conversation we're going to have, is anyone who is a citizen of a federally recognized tribe. That's who Indian is. That's why Governor Stitt, who looks like he's from Germany, <laughs> is a Cherokee citizen. He is a, by all counts, because he's a citizen of that nation, a Indian by law. Because it's a legal word, it's a political status. Um, so, you know, there's always people are shocked when they meet 
uh, Cherokees and Chickasaws and on and on, and they're mainly white people. And they wonder, well, how did you get an Indian car? You know, all of this stuff. And it's, a lot of this is based on ignorance about a tribe. They're just political status. And, and ironically, um, most of the tribes that were from the Deep South uh, has, have next segregated with Africans and Europeans for 500 years. So we do have full bloods, or what we call full bloods in the Creek Nation, and some in the Cherokee Nation, and then some and some and so forth. But the majority of the population today, I think it's like 85, 87% in the Creek Nation is less than what's called one quarter blood. You know, so, but that doesn't make them no less Creek than someone else because it's just a political status. You know, just like if a black person, a white person, whatever, Latino, whatever, is an American citizen, no one's race should make them more American than because somebody is black or somebody is white or whatever. You know, at least that's the way it's supposed to be. So, I'm gonna give you a little history about, um, and the reason why I have this, this thing up there that says enforce the treaties of Indian territory, and I have all the presidents there, because every single president, we call them Wajenas, uh, have dealt with treaties, particularly with the Creek Nation. And the Creek's last treaty was in 1866. And that treaty had to do, um, yeah, there you go. That treaty had to do uh, with the Civil War. And so a little background on it is that uh, the five tribes from the Deep South uh, historically enslaved people of African descent. They were the original slaveholders in the Deep South. The first black person to be brought into the Creek Nation <clears throat> was in 1541. Now, when we think about slavery in America, we always say 1619, right? Now, in the Creek Nation, it was 1541. DeSoto himself wrote that. It was his enslaved Africans that he bought on his expedition through the Creek Nation, and they ran away from him. And they ran away into the tribal towns of the Gidobas of the Muscogee Nation, which was the tribe of the Deep South. And some of them, what's funny is that uh, there was another expedition about 20 years later, and they came through looking for these people. And there they were adopted into creation with wives and children. These were former slaves of the Spanish. So that's our first note. And he, of course, he wouldn't have been the only one. He's the actual only one that was actually recorded. You know, we had pirates. We had all kind of stuff going on in the Deep South that um, unfortunately history never recorded. But uh, DNA today proves a lot of strange stuff, particularly in my tribe. Um, but in saying that, the Creeks enslaved people of African descent for profit was part of the tribe's economy. We had slave laws written as far as 1817, before the removal, and the Muscogee Nation collectively regulated the institution of slavery within this tribe, and black people were a product. And um, it's interesting because uh, it's, and it, it's a little more complicated, too, because uh, you think about uh, an Indian male having kids with an African woman, and you have kids who are actually have Indian or indigenous and have African from the Eastern Hemisphere. What happened to these kids? Aren't they tribal members? No. They still remain in chattel slavery because slavery followed the uh, mother. And if the mother was enslaved, then the child was enslaved. That's what chattel slavery is. Now, what if the uh, Indian woman have a child with an African male? What happened to that child? 
But that child became a tribal member because the mother was not enslaved. And in the Muskoka Nation, like the Cherokees, for example, I think the Seminoles had the same uh, type of citizenship. It was matrilineal. Only a female can bestow tribal citizenship on anyone, not, not men. It's like being a Jew. If your mom's a Jew, then you're a Jew, but not your dad. You know, your dad can't just go out and marry a Christian or whatever and expect that child to be Jewish. That's not how it works. The mother has to be Jewish. And so in the Creek Nation, to have citizenship in our tribe or in our tribal town, the mom had to be a citizen of the tribe, had a clan, and was a member of one of the tribal towns. It's one of the reasons why there was a big influx of white men from Europe marrying Indian women and ending up with kids like William McIntosh, whose uncle was a white man that was the governor of Georgia. He had ties to the tribe because his mom was Indian, but his dad was a white man. And so in the, in the institution of slavery in the tribe, if the mother was an Indian and the father was an African, then the child was considered a tribal member with a clan of the mother. But if the father was the Indian and the mother was African, then the child remained in child slavery. That was pretty much the law in, in those days. Now, you know, everybody's seen roots, everybody, you know, I grew up in Mississippi. And I grew up thinking only white people in Mississippi enslaved black folks. And yet, I'm sitting my butt in these schools not knowing that my own family participated in it. You know, I thought I was above all that. And come to find out in 2020, no, not 2020, in the year 2000, um, I was just, the internet was new. There was a website called Roots Web back in the day and people could connect doing genealogy and all this kind of stuff. And I started reading this page, uh, particularly in Oklahoma, uh, black people who were fighting for their tribal membership in the Creek Nation, Choctaw Nation, Chickasaw Nation, Cherokee Nation, so forth. And I thought, wow, that's so strange, you know? And then the story uh, lines were going, oh, my family was owned by the Colberts, my family was owned by the Graysons, my family was owned by the McGeverys and the Colberts and blah, blah, blah. And I was like, this is all BS. Indians didn't own slaves. You know, that's because that's what I had been taught. And uh, on one of my breaks, I went to the Los Angeles uh, City Library on Bunker Hill and they had an incredible collection of native books and history of the tribes all over the country. And one of the books was on the Grayson family. And it talked about the Graysons enslaving black folk. Blew me away. There was a book called African and Creeks. Blew me away by Dr. Daniel Littlefield, who was the Dean of Native Studies at the University of Laurel. And so, you know, you, you get new brain cells and you expand and you grow. My brain just in, in a matter of time just, I mean, I got these books and just buried myself in it because I felt like it was the first time I'm really actually learning the truth about my native side. And a lot of it wasn't pretty. And then later I found out that um, the Cherokee freedmen, who were descendants of Cherokee slaves, had been booted out, and they were filing a lawsuit, and they were soliciting for money. And I thought, you know what? You know, being a gay male from West Hollywood, I know what this, I remember back when before West Hollywood was called, we used to get hit by eggs and crap standing in line going to bars, you know? And I had no family and a shitload of money, and I decided to start donating to the uh, Freedom Organization that was started here. And I got involved with them, and that is the beginning of my journey into fighting for the freedom of the Indian Territory. And, and actually trying to educate the public on what this is. Now, everybody in here knows that um, 
Slavery in America ended when? June 19, 1865 in Galveston, Texas, right? That's what we celebrate Juneteenth. Not here. It was June 14, 1866, when slavery ended here on this land that, we were, what, that we're staying, sitting in. A whole year later, slavery existed here. It was July 19, 1866, a month later, a year and a month later, just north of Africa in the Cherokee Nation. In the Choctaw Chickasaw Nation, it was April 28, 1866. In the Seminole Nation, it was March 21st, 1866. My point is that here in Indian Territory, it went on another year that people were held in bondage. And these are the things that I started to discover and, and read about. And it just was just, why hasn't the movie been made about this? And why haven't, you know, people talked about it? Why isn't this in public schools? And coming here to Oklahoma and looking at the, you know, kids, books, their history books and stuff like that, that's not the history you get in public schools. And it's a shame because Oklahoma itself has the most unique history in America, even with the allotments. I mean, here's a little ticket that has nothing to do with the freedmen, but just think about this as women. Think about this. The allotments happen in Oklahoma Territory as well as Indian Territory. And here in Indian Territory, with the Choctaw, Chickasaw, the Muley that all from, the Muscogee Creek, the Cherokee and the Seminole, more than half their population were females. They got land allotments. In the Creek Nation, women, babies, girls, got 160 acres, just like 80-year-old males. They got 160 acres. The same way in the Cherokee Nation, same way in the Seminole Nation, and the Choctaw Chickasaw Nation, the Indian citizen, got 412, what was it, 320 acres. You know, literally half the land in eastern Oklahoma at statehood in 1907 was owned by women. In Oklahoma territory, where you have 32 other tribes carrying on, the same shit happened. And literally at statehood and before statehood, half the land of Indian territory, and I'm not talking about those land run plots that get all the news. Most of the land belonged to tribes. And half the land went to females. And in the new state of Oklahoma, guess what? Women couldn't vote. Yet they were half the land owners. And nowhere in America, nowhere anywhere, did women collectively own that much land in 1907. Nowhere. And so when you think about the freedmen, the black folk, who made up a third of the population of Indian Territory, they received a third of the land too. You know? So anyway, so, and we'll talk about that for a second, which is another strange thing in Oklahoma that's not talked about. Um, well, the tribes um, were booted out of the southeast, and with them came their enslaved people of African descent, at least the ones they didn't sell off to the white plantation owners who were taking over the deep south. Everybody, if you grew up in Mississippi, Alabama, any of those states, every black person you meet is gonna tell you that Granny was a black foot Indian. I've heard that all my life, and I just go, okay, my folks are real Indians from Oklahoma. And you're telling me that the Blackfoot Nation is from Mississippi? No, they're not. They're up in Montana and Canada. So how did this story get kind of blown out of proportion? And the disconnect is that there was some truth to part of the story that at one point, their family may have been enslaved by one of the five tribes of the Deep South. And during the removal, was sold off to pay for the fare to get here to Indian Territory. 
Not everybody was pushed down on something called the Trail of Tears. Some of the wealthier tribal members, particularly the slavers, decided to come out on their own expense, and then the federal government reimbursed them. Everybody else had to be moved by human cargo companies. Yeah, that's what happened in remote. Human cargo companies literally moved the tribes here, and the federal government paid them to do so per person, whatever. So a lot of the wealthy slaving families uh, came out on their own dime and they got reimbursed. But a lot of those families that, I mean, enslaved people that they would sell off to the new people taking over their plantations, um, had these stories that they were part Indian and soon they became, they were black people. And on and on and on. There's a whole kind of untold, in our, in some of our books at the Tribal Library, it talks about some of the slang terminologies that were used for the Indians Negro, is what it was called back in the day. And that, that person was considered different than the enslaved African held by white plantation owners. The Indian slave was, one, familiar with the land, familiar with tribal tongue, knew all the paths of the Indians. And they were being sold and mixed up with the enslaved person who was owned by white people. And so one of the terminologies were nigger toes and blackfoot and all these things it's in our records. And strangely, we hear people saying, oh, Grand was a blackfoot. And at the tribe, we initially know, oh, yeah, we know what that meant back in the day. That meant that your person, your family was actually owned by one of the tribes and sold to a white plantation during the removal. So anyway, so slavery went on here. We talk about the Trail of Tears. We never talk about the enslaved people carrying the crap. When we think about the Trail of Tears, we're thinking about people struggling and carrying on. And the reality is many other enslaved Africans, the ones that were not shackled to the bottom of riverboats and brought here, were forced, particularly males, to make the packs, to clear the trees for the masses to come through, to make the bridges to cross, all of this stuff. They did the work of enslaved people, and they get no recognition in our history books, and it's not right. So these, these are some of the things that uh, you find in university books and on and on, but you don't find them in local, you know, high schools and I mean, people just don't get that history. You, you get the, you know, India makes make baskets and do TPs and that shit, but you don't get the real story of the struggle that actually went on here to actually make what happened happen here. Well, the Civil War broke out. And the five tribes allied with the Confederate South. Not because, oh, they, didn't, they wanted to be against the Union. They wanted to protect their interests in enslaving black folk, because that was the money. And this is the difference between slavery in the tribes and slavery in the states. It's all economics. If you were a plantation owner in Raymond, Mississippi, for example, um, you own you know, 10,000 acres and 150 slaves, and you needed money to, for the next crop of cotton, and you went to Chase Bank in New York, and you can either borrow against your enslaved Africans, or you can borrow against the 10,000 acres. Not so in Indian Territory, because no one in Indian Territory owned land. The slaver only owned the black person. The land was owned by the tribe, held by the federal government. So you can go borrow against it. And the way it used to happen back in the day, if you needed, if you, if you became an adult, you wanted to start a family, you went to the House of Kings and the House of Warriors, which is like our U.S. 
Senate and U.S. House of Representatives from the Muscogee Nation, called House of Kings, House of Warriors, same type of thing. And you went to your king, which is your Nico, and basically said, you know, I need 500 acres, I'm gonna get married and have kids and all this stuff. Well, they gave you a two-year lease on whatever the 500 acres you wanted, wherever you wanted. If someone else wasn't using it, it's fine. And for two years, you worked that. You didn't own it. You worked it, you made your money, and you're living off of it. And it was yours as long as you went back to the council every two years and then piss off a chief. And they would give it back to you. But if you fell over dead, you couldn't leave it to your kids. You can use it as collateral on, uh, you know, credit somewhere because the land belonged to the tribe. You only had the right to use it. So even before the Civil War broke out in Indian Territory, why slavery was so important to the tribes was because the value of the black person was the only value you had. You didn't have it in the land. So when the war broke out and they allied with the Confederate South uh, to protect their sovereign, sovereign right to enslave black folk, that's what it was about. As harsh as that sounds, that's exactly what it was for anything else, no other reason for it. And thank God they lost the war. You know, we, you can Google this. This is what's amazing about Oklahoma. There are a number of Civil War battles happening right here in Tulsa County. Just south of Turley up there, over 500 black people were slaughtered by Cherokees who were Creeks and Seminoles. And we're talking about finding 300 bodies in Green and Oakland Cemetery. Go find those 500 people that were slaughtered just south of Turley. And anybody who in the, in the Civil War recreations, everybody knows about it, but the public. And guess what those black folks were doing? Women, babies, men, they were running for their lives to Kansas, following a chief who had been a former slaver himself named Old Gouge, or who we call Obedly Yahoo. They followed him up there. Many of the Indians, my own family, followed him up there to Kansas to get away from the battles that were going on here. And after a few years here, when everything was basically destroyed, um, and it was obvious that the Union was gonna win, a lot of the Confederate Indians jumped ship and became Union warriors. Yeah. And anyway, the lost the war. As a condition of surrender, we have the treaty. And I know if you live here, you've heard about the McGirt decision, but no one knows what that shit is. Give you a five minute thing to make it real simple for you. McGirt is about Article Three of the 1866 Treaty, the very treaty that ended the Civil War in the Creek Nation. And Article Two of that very treaty, um, you guys wanna see it? Yeah. Let's see if I can get this computer back. And I apologize if any porn show up accidentally. <laughs> that shit has happened to me before. Even in speaking before Congress, some crap like that happened. Grinder pop up on my damn thing, and I'm like, what is that? <laughs> Let's see here. Uh, treaty, treaty, treaty. I know I. Let's see that out here. Yes, they didn't Okay, I know where it is. I 
I know that's not what you guys want to see. You have to speak Creek, but that's actually the treaty. I'm going to give it to you in English. We do have our language and um, one thing that's That's Article 2. But the whole treaty was about ending the war. The tribe had allied with the Confederate South to protect this right to enslave black folk. They lost the war as a condition of surrender. The federal government went out the land, and it made the Creeks do certain things. The land became what's called Oklahoma Territory. Oklahoma City actually used to be within the Creek Nation. And where Norma, Norman, Oklahoma is, where OU is, used to be a Seminole Nation. The Creek Nation used to go all the way up to the Texas Panhandle. The Cherokee Nation used to go all the way across where the Osage is, all the way across the Cherokee Strip to the Oklahoma Panhandle. The Choctaw and Chickasaw Nation made up the southern part of the state. You know, they split that. But as a condition of surrender, tribes had to forfeit two-thirds of their lands that eventually became what's called Oklahoma Territory. And interesting, the tribes did negotiate who could be on those lands after the federal government took them. And they were supposed to go to Indians and freedmen from the states, not the tribes, but black people from Mississippi, black people from Tennessee were to be settled there, but that never happened. They ended up settling 32 other tribes there, basically. And then what wasn't used, they opened it up in 1889, called the Organic Act, and we call it the land runs, or the land grabs of squatters and everybody else. And that happened in 1889. That's where Oklahoma City is, Enid, all of that area like that. But then you'll notice when you're in Western Oklahoma that you have these other tribes, the Shine Arapaho, on and on and on. They still have geographically their reservations that were established after 1866 due to this treaty. So the treaty ended the Civil War. It also basically did this, five things in Article Two. Uh, the Creeks hereby covenant and agree that his fourth neither slavery nor involuntary servitude otherwise than in the punishment of crimes whereof the party shall have been duly convicted in accordance with laws and applicable to all members of the tribe shall ever exist in said nation. And, his, and, and as so much as there are among the Creeks many persons of African descent, we have no interest in the soil. It is stipulated that hereafter these persons lawfully residing in said Creek country under the laws and usages or who have been thus residing in said country and may return within one year of the ratification of this treaty and their descendants and such others of the same race as may be permitted and blah, 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 blah. So it's talking about the slaves there the people who had been enslaved on the tribes. And basically, Article Two gave the black people, and by the way, in our treaties, in this particular treaty in 1866, the only people that the treaty actually protects are the black slaves. It does give no individual protection to the individual Indian whatsoever. It gives protection to the tribal nation, but not the individual citizen of the nation, except the freedmen. And it basically says five things is gonna happen. Slavery, that bullshit is over. It's done. You can call it a wrap. Two, your slaves are now your tribal members. That's number two. Three, they're gonna have an equal interest in the soil. Four, an equal interest in the national funds. 
And five, they're to be treated the same as the native citizen. And that number five is important because the federal government is obligated to that as well. And it goes back to the definition of who is an Indian. Anybody that's a citizen of a tribe is a damn Indian. And if the black people were citizens who had been former slaves, then they're legal Indians by law because it's a political status, it's not a race. And so that's the beginning of tribal citizenship within. Now, earlier, there were times where black folks were able to purchase themselves on the, on the Creek Nation law. If they earned enough money, that they went to their owners and bought themselves and freed themselves. But they had no rights as citizens because they didn't have a clan. You had to have a clan to be anything in the Creek Nation back in the day. And you had to be a member of a tribal town, but you were free. So, I mean, it's, get, it's extremely complicated, you know, and so this is what, and so after the Civil War, you had the Reconstruction years in Indian Territory and some of the most amazing historical things happened. The first black person in the United States to sit on the Supreme Court was in the Creek Nation. 1878, a man named Jesse Franklin was chosen by the House of Kings and the House of Warriors to serve on the Creek Nation Supreme Court. And he represented the district called Okmuggie District, which included this area of Tulsa back in the day. And if you did some shit and got in trouble, he put your ass to death. The brother didn't play. Is that Christie's? Yeah, Christy Williams, that's her third great grandfather. Um, yeah, and because that's the way the tribal laws were. The tribal laws back in the day against crime, you, you stole a horse. Um, if you stole three times, you've got the shit beat out of you. That's just the reality. They would take you and beat the hell out of you. And you couldn't do anything about it, but take it. But you didn't go stealing no more because you had whips on your back to remind you what stealing would do. And if you kill somebody, guess what happened? You didn't live on them because the courts didn't put up with that and they put you to death. That was the law of Indian Territory. Now this is ironic because we talked about McGurk. McGurk is talking about the same treaty the next article after Article 2 is talking about Article 3, which is the, the reservation area, which is based on the land that they took from us that created Oklahoma Territory and the domain area that was actually left, which is historically what we know as the Creek Nation today. That's Article 3. And if the Supreme Court says Article 3 is valid, then the Creek Nation has to say Article 2 has got to be valid too. And they just can't put out the blacks, and that's exactly what they did in 1979. They just said, oh, we're gonna organize them a tribe, and we're gonna kick the blacks out. And they did it. And behind the scenes, it was all based on per capita payments that the federal government was paying at the time, back in the 70s. And the chief back then didn't want the blacks to have the money. So he cooked up this scheme about, oh, well, they're just slaves. They don't have Indian blood, so why should they get this money? This money's going to go to the Indians. Well, they were legal Indians, but he made it about a blood issue. Now, this is what was crazy, because growing up in Mississippi, I never met a black person who said, oh, I'm a citizen of the state of Mississippi because my grandfather was a white man. You get that? And so what the argument was in 1979 is to say that this black person who had been descendants of people who had been enslaved by the tribe for how many ever generations had no rights because they did not carry the blood of their slave. That bullshit. And it went over, because people don't think. There's no critical thinking. Somebody should have said, well, why would they want to be the descendant of somebody enslaving them? But it didn't make them no less creep, but because folks were ignorant to what a tribal member was, they got booted out by a vote of the people. 
And that happened in 1979. So they not only got money stolen from them through the years, they got booted out based over a lie that still is relevant today. Because everybody I meet in the Creek Nation, they're always going around talking about how much Indian blood they got. And I always, I, I always say, you better be glad there ain't no war going on with the Americans. Because I don't believe you would stand up for the Creek Nation at all. Your ass would side with Oklahoma in a minute. Or OU or OSU or whatever the football team you belong to. <laughs> <laughs> well, they don't understand our traditions. And you say, well, what's that? Well, our traditions. I said, well, I've been living in Oklahoma a while, and I know the most traditional thing we all do is shop on the shop at Walmart. <laughs> Hello? That's what we all do. That's what tradition is. So they do that. So what are you talking about? So I'm very practical in dealing with bullshit. And I don't let somebody wave their, you know, super creek shit in front of me without me calling them out on it. You know, because it's all about history, and we all collectively had to get here together. It makes no sense to deny the part that got us here. It just doesn't make sense to me. So in 1979, the tribe booted the freedmen out, and they've been fighting ever since. In 1982, the Choctaw Nation booted its blacks out. They followed the Creek Nation. Now, what's so ironic by that, the Choctaw Chickasaw Treaty was very interesting. It wasn't like the Cherokee and the Seminole and the, and the uh, Muscogee Creek Treaty. The Choctaw and Chickasaw Treaty in 1866, because they were mainly a mixed white tribe at the time, and more of their leaders were prominent white people who had incredible connections in Washington, D.C., basically lobbied that the government, federal government, was to pay them for each of the black people that they freed. So in their treaties, $300,000 were put up and the feds told them, split it up. But this is the money you're gonna get to free your blacks and make them your tribal members. They were paid. And then some bullshit went on, we're gonna go into details of that. But the Choctaw Nation didn't get all their money by the 1950s. And they turned around and sued the federal government and the Court of Claims in the 1950s that basically said, 90 years after the damn war, y'all ain't paid us for all these black folks we freed. We want our money. And we want interest on top of it. They got it. They won that shit on the Court of Claims in the 1950s. 1982, less than 30 years later, they booted these very black folks out on that same bullshit about Indian blood. Then we have the uh, Seminole Nation. They tried to boot the blacks out on the Bill Clinton. Bill Clinton wasn't having that shit. He shut them down. Shut their asses down instead of VA. And Seminole Nation sued. They lost that lawsuit because the court said, you got a treaty. The treaty is valid. If you don't want it valid, then you don't have a right to exist. Your only reason that you exist as a tribal nation is because of this, this document. And you want to deny articles in it, you weaken everything else in it. You know? So, and then the Cherokee Nation tried to craft, and everybody knows about that if you live here, because it, that lawsuit went on for 17 years. And the Seminole, the Cherokee Nation finally relinquished and gave up because they kept losing. And all kind of shit was happening in Washington, D.C. with the Congressional Black Caucus finding out that, oh, the Cherokees own slaves, is that why they all white people? This shit didn't look good. I'm just saying, that's the, what was happening. So I did a lot of lobbying. Barney Frank happened to be one of my best friends back in those days. And he was chair of the Committee on Financial Services. He gave us a good hand on the Nahasta Bill, which is the Native American House and Assistant Bill. And we got language in there that says if the Cherokee Nation kicked their blacks out without a federal court order, they're going to lose their housing money. 
And that was the first piece of legislation written in 100 years dealing directly with freedom. And it scared the shit out of these people. And so there was a vote, basically, from the new chiefs, and Bill John Baker won. He got the support of the freedmen. And so their tribe has actually been on a really good direction dealing with that and moving on. We're all in this together, blah, blah, blah. The other tribes, not so. So finally, we have the McGirt shit that went down a couple of years ago, and which has scared everybody because nobody knows what that's about. And it's talking about the domain of the Creek Nation and its citizens. And so the citizens, according to the treaty, would include the black folks that they had enslaved, but they want to deny, oh, they have any rights because they're not Indians, but that's against federal law because the courts have already defined an Indian as anybody who you say is a citizen. So we have, interesting is that Governor Stitt wrote a, recently a amicus brief to a new case to overthrow the McGirt decision. Basically, what happens is that as a tribal member of the Muscogee Nation living within the Muscogee Nation, I'm under tribal law and federal law. And if I get arrested for anything, I must first be tried in tribal court and not in state court, county court, or any of that bullshit. They have to send me to tribal court. And if the court don't want to deal with me, they'll send me to federal court, but not state court. So the governor here, who's the Cherokee governor, <laughs> decided that was a threat to white power here. Now, and then the whole argument is that with the Indians in control of these the small population of people, crime is gonna run amok. And we can't prosecute. They can do what they want to do, and we can't do anything because we have no jurisdiction over them, blah, 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 blah. Now, ironically, this is what's so funny. The creation of the state of Oklahoma came from the same narrative. White people squatted here. They found out that Indians and freedmen owned the land, broke the laws, all that shit, and they couldn't build schools, they couldn't build roads, they couldn't put in plumbing, because they were squatting. And so they pushed for the end of the tribes so they can have control. That's how the state happened. The Town Site Act that created this city called Tulsa is the Town Site Act of May 1901. You can look it up. 654 acres were was taken from the Muscogee Creek Nation. 654 acres. Right here, we're sitting right in it. Uh, and it was to create the town site in Tulsa. And originally, under this committee that Congress set up, they, one Indian could be represented on this town site committee. And the land would be plotted, and divided up, and then sold to the highest bidder. And whatever that sale is, the money would go to the Creek Nation to pay them for the 654 acres. So this is the shit that went down. <laughs> they divided up this downtown area and to little plots and all kinds of shit. And selling that shit for a dime. That's the money the Creek Nation got. And the person that ended up with it flipped it for $5,000. And that was legal because the government, federal government allowed it to go on. And the whole push for the town site was this shit. The tribes could not control criminals. It's the same argument that Stephen Biden has today. It's the same thing. This is happening all over again. This is a different year, and because most people don't know how Tulsa, or Bristow, or Muskogee, or Coweta, or any of these town sites were actually formed, um, it's happening again. You know, and it's basically the power to be that are in control, don't want to lose power that they shouldn't have had in the first place. And all of it's pushed by private prisons anyway, because they're the ones that's making the money off crime, not the criminals. They get the, you know, 
the Airbnb costs for you know housing somebody for 30 years. You know, so that's who's actually lobbying against it. But it's all based on that. We, the state can't control crime here, which is what they said to create the state. White people can control the crimes of Indians. And the crazy thing about Indians, you committed a crime in our nation, you didn't get away with that shit. Not at all. There was no homelessness in the Creek Nation. None. Zero. You needed land, go out there and work on it. We'll give it to you. You didn't have to pay for it. There was no homelessness like it is today. So, you know, speaking of the Freeman again, and the land allotments that came about during that same time. The allotment started in 1898, ended April 26, 1906. And in the Creek Nation, everybody got 160 acres, the freedmen and the Indians. You could read stories. If you're ever interested in the richest black girl in America in 1914, her name is Sarah Rector. Her allotment was over in Creek County, near Drumway. It was divided up. This little black girl, who was born in 1802, had oil and gas, not gas at the time, no gas, but oil, being produced off her allotment, unlike anything in Saudi Arabia. And she's running around with no shoes on. But the family that took the lease off her land was building mansions in Bristol and everywhere else. And the NAACP, this is written in the Crisis Magazine in 1914, came down and grabbed her because they knew she was going to get killed like her father got killed. And they took her to Kansas. She's a black girl. And to get her royalties paid to her, they had the state of Kansas create a birth certificate making her white. Yes, that's shit. Yeah. They're a record. You should read about it. It's fascinating. Richest black girl in America in 1914. But she didn't know it. And when she became an adult, she figured out the shit and she got her shit back. And she took control of herself. She educated herself. She went to Tuskegee University College. She did all kind of shit before she died by taking control of her life. But she was lucky. Because the majority of people that it happened to were not so lucky. Around Tulsa is a good example. We talk about the 21 race massacre. And we talked about Oakland Cemetery for a long time. Oakland Cemetery is the allotment of a little black girl named Centennial Manual. That was her allotment. She never got to use it. Her brother, was a little kid, two-year-old boy named Ellis Manuel. Ironically, it's where Lee Elementary School, which is now called Council Oak, that was his little one. He died in 1974. He was a World War II vet. He owned a barbershop in Muskogee. All of that, but never benefited from the fact that part of his land allotment was in the richest community in Tulsa. Because he didn't benefit from and the whole thing with the allotments happened like this. The government basically was saying, oh, we're gonna give the, do you, don't you rather own the land yourself instead of the tribal government? You know, who could take it from you after two years? Well, you can own it and it'll stay in your family for 20 generations. That's the lobby propaganda crap of a big old lie that they actually told the people. And so the tribes actually had to vote on it. And the majority thought, oh yeah, it's better to own the land than the tribe on the land. And it ended up passing and the law was happened. And it turned out to be a disaster. You know, it was a quick money. There was all kind of shit going on. There was a term called nigger right. Let me tell you what that is. These oil and gas speculators, once they realized that oil was here, <laughs> the Indians have always known oil was here, and that's why they threw them out here to kill them. Have them breathe that shit and die. There was no discovery of oil. It was the use of oil 
that was the difference. People needed to use it. But in the letters, and during the Civil War, and even before the Civil War with the Indian agents to Washington, D.C., they're always talking about how the air was full of poison and the black tar and all this stuff is written again and again and again. There was no big discovery. It was always known it was there. Nobody had a use for it until after the Civil War. And then they realized, oh shit, we put those Indians out there. What are we gonna do to get that land back? You know, that's what happened. So they pushed this land a lot and stuff, and individuals became landowners, black people in the Creek Nation. There are two classes of black folks in the Creek Nation. You have black people who are enrolled because they have a by blood ancestor. It goes back to the mother was an Indian, but the father was African. And then you had the freedmen, who mothers were chattel slavery. And they were kept in slavery. But they all became tribal members in 1866. And so when the allotments happened under the, under the treaty, they had an equal interest in the soil. If the Indian citizen was gonna get 160, then the freedmen was gonna get 160. That's what that, how that played out. But that didn't happen until 1898, not 1866. So a third of the population of the Creek Nation were freedmen, a third. The freedmen in the Creek Nation, in the geographic area of the Creek Nation, received 1,092,240 acres of land. That was their share, that was a third of the land. 1,092,240 acres. That's just in the Creek Nation. The Seminoles had freedmen, the Cherokees had freedmen, Choctaw Chickasaws had freedmen, even though they treated their blacks worse. Their freedmen only got 40 acres and the Indians got 320. And if you were a white male who had married a Chickasaw or Choctaw Indian, you got 320 acres. But a black person who had been enslaved by that damn tribe for centuries only got 40. Let that sit in game. That happened. So, a third of the land in eastern Oklahoma was owned by black folk, who either were part Indian or freedmen descendant. Now, think about Greenwood. We think about Greenwood as Black Wall Street, the wealthiest community, but we never think about why. Because I don't think a barbershop made nobody no goddamn millionaire when you think about it. And a dollar a week hotel, how the shit somebody's gonna make a living out that? I'm practical. I think like that. And if you own a business like I have for years, it's hard to make a living some of those months. And the same thing would have happened then. And we oftentimes forget about the economy of Oklahoma back in those days, and stayed up until 1921, and all the conditions of the BS that went on during that time. Guess what went on in the world before 1921, after Oklahoma became a state in 1907. World War I, where Europe was blowing up their crap over there, they couldn't feed each other, all this shit, because they kept burning down their cornfields and stuff. So guess who was feeding them? We were. Crops, agriculture, was the number one business in Oklahoma as statehood, not oil and gas. Gas came later anyway, because you couldn't fight the shit. And so they didn't. But it was oil, but it wasn't the top of the food chain. It was agriculture. And we were supplying the world, particularly Europe, with crops. And when the war was over, depression basically set in. Crops became worthless in 1919. Read about it. And the anxiety across the U.S., particularly if you were in the business of agriculture, like most people were farmers in those days, they went looking and hunting for work. And oil had taken off in Oklahoma. And so you had a lot of white folks from Mississippi, a lot of white folks from Alabama and places like that coming here. But they were shot. Unlike Mississippi, you got Indians, minority women, only land and black folks though, they were the landowners. And you had to share crop from one of them, which was not their condition in the deep south. It was different. 
So you had this animosity and all this anger and frustration and jealousy and people was like, that shit ain't right, all this stuff. Because this is the pot that they came into, not understanding what, what this was about when they got here. So, you know, the blow up of, you know, the, the girl on the elevator and all that stuff, the tinder box was a, the, the box itself was the entire Eastern Oklahoma. Something wasn't right about half the land being owned by women who didn't have a right to vote. But they were the land. Anyway, so we talk about the um, Black Wall Street, but we don't talk about why it was wealthy. It was wealthy because a third of the land in Eastern Oklahoma was owned by black folk. And a lot of the crops and the oil was produced from their lands. And because of Jim Crow laws in this state, where black folks couldn't shop in white stores, and they had to stay on the certain side of the track and all that shit, they spend money in their own places. And their towns, particularly here in Eastern Oklahoma, became extremely successful. Because when you think about Boley, Oklahoma, being a wealthy black community, Boley actually had a bank. Muskogee, Oklahoma had two black communities and both of those black communities had banks. Greenwood never had a bank. Never had a bank up there. So when you think about the driving money, what was the, found, what was the economic foundation of that time, which was agriculture followed by oil, None of that was happening on Greenwood Boulevard. Those were retail shops where people spent their money. But that's not where the money was actually being generated. It was generated on the farms that black folks actually own, who happen to be tribal members of one of the five civilized tribes. That's where the wealth came from. So when you think about Boley, you can't think about Boley's Main Street. You've got to think about the 100,000 acres that black folks owned around them that generated corn and cotton and peanuts and all kind of crap that was going to Europe back in those days. So when, you know, so, you know, it, it goes back to some, and we were trying to, from a tribal perspective, educate the documentary people and uh, from Oprah people to uh, LeBron James, everybody was down here doing the documentary for the 21 Race Massacre. And we were hearing some of this junk history that O.W. Gurley bought 40 acres of land and started Greenwood. And we were like, hello, that wouldn't have been legal. White people can buy 40 acres of land in Indian territory. How the hell a black man gonna show up and buy 40 acres of land and he's from the States? Land was not for sale, number one. So where did this story come from? This is very interesting. Uh, the church over there, Mount Vernon, you guys been there? I was over there talking to that preacher one day and I'm sitting in his office and on a plaque on the wall is the original deed to the church. It was delicious. It was just right there in front of everybody. And I said to Robert Turner, I said, what is that? And he said, that's the deed to the church. And we were talking about the story of Gurley, how that could not have been right. And he said, oh my God, he just kind of looked at me. Because I told him, I said, the person that actually owned the land up here was an Indian woman named Mary Turley, with a T. Mary Turley, she's the one that owned the land up there where that church is and the cultural center and all that stuff in the Cherokee Nation. You go under that bridge, if you're at Greenwood and Archer, you're in the Creek Nation. You go north under that bridge, you're in the Cherokee Nation. And when you cross under that bridge over into the Cherokee Nation, of course that bridge wasn't there at the time, and the streets were very different at when they did the town site. That was Mary Turley's lot. And right there in that deed, he thought it said O.W. Gurley. It was Mary Turley. And he was like, oh my God, he said just, I always thought that was girl. I never really looked at it. And it's plain as day right there. 
So they finally looked it up. It was Marilee Turley. She sold the land to the, to the parishioners of Mount Vernon back in the day. Her husband happened to be a man named James Turley, who was the same white man that developed Turley, Oklahoma. He was a developer. And they were in the business of real estate and development up in that area back in the day. And their history has been totally left out of that narrative, you know? So, oh, I know, I was trying to get this up. Anyway, um, <laughs> trust me, this past not been done. Um, but the, the thing about it, when any of these stories that you, we see and read about in Tulsa, and we don't dig deeply behind it, uh, like who were the landowners and what tribal nation that was here before, and then some of these stories where people talk about, oh, somebody showed up in 1880 and did this and did that, and we just go, that could not have happened. You know, because you had to be a tribal member to live here. And if you were here, you were called a immigrant worker. And the council took your record. You had to have a sponsor from the House of Kings and the House of Warriors to sponsor you to actually work here. And so we got you on record of all the immigrants. We have rows that are called the immigrants. They're working. We talk about the, you know, here's another narrative. Uh, Jinx. Everybody knows where Jinx is. Rich little town down there. How many people know that Jinx was actually the first black community in Tulsa County? But it wasn't called Jinx. It was called Renty's Grove. The cemetery is still down there, right by that little elementary school. It was established by Creek Freedmen after the Civil War. They even had a Creek Freedmen school there. And it later became drinks. The Rentes families, there, that was their allotments back in the day. Um, we think about, I, was, I mean, there's so many, like the original, like in the town site of Tulsa, before the town site, there was a black community there, freedmen who refused, Creek freedmen who refused to work on the railroads into the Cherokee Nation because in the 1860s, black people had been slaughtered by the Cherokees trying to go to Kansas. So when the railroads came through, and you had to be a Creek, we lobbied to have the railroads come through here, they had to hire our people. They just couldn't send immigrant workers through here. They had to hire Indians and freedmen to work on the railroad. But the Creek freedmen themselves refused to go into the Cherokee Nation. And so they settled an area that they called Hodges Bands. Completely left out of history. There's a bar down there now called Hodges Bands, right in that damn spot. That area was there long before Greenwood. And when we talk about Greenwood itself, oh, it came from, that's the name for the band from Greenwood, Mississippi. Who would I know that? <laughs> Gus and Dave Patton, who were from Greenwood, Arkansas. They were the two boys, they were boys at the time, ironically, hired to plot out the town site of Tulsa in 1902. And if you ever want to see the first map of Tulsa, it is June 14, 1902. It's by Gus and Dave Patton. Creek Nation hired and It says Creek Nation at the top, Department of Interior, all this stuff. And then there's the town site that was created in 1902 after the 1901 passage of the town site act. And they named that street after their hometown in Greenwood, Arkansas. It's right there in all writings. But it goes back to people don't talk. Folks write books and shit and they don't, you know, and of course, I will admit that sometimes when you go down to the Creek Nation, to our library, they don't want to deal with you. That's just true. And sometimes they just wonder what you want to know. And I sit there and listen to some BS come out of there just to, to get a giggle once they walked out the door. <laughs> and these are people that came in for a history lesson. And it goes back to nobody trusts me. And in our tribe, because we have been dealt a bad hand of land grabs again and again and again and again, nobody wants to uh, go into details about 
why and when and shit like that happened because it goes back to a trust thing. But the records are there if you want to look at it. You know, and you may in some cases have to get an interpreter because many of our records are written in Muskogee. They're not written in English. You know, so anyway, I know we got off the subject of the freedmen, but I just uh, hope that, um, you know, if you want to peel back layers of stuff, you know, just don't take the whole you know, stack of paper, peel it back and look at each thing because each layer is actually more interesting here than anywhere on the planet. You know, I, I think about this man named Jesse Franklin, a black guy pointed to the Creek Nation Supreme Court in 1878, had been a slave of the tribe. And now he's sitting as the chief, chief one of the chief justices of the tribe, just in a, 10 years after he was actually emancipated. You know, that didn't happen anywhere else. You know, the fact that black folk actually, you know, we think about black folks in the deep south, the 40 acres in the mule and all that stuff. When the Creek Nation, the allotments were not reparations because the Indians got them too. And the whole sinister thing about the allotments when the benefit them, because most freedmen lost their allotment lands, 80% of them by 1950, the land was stolen from. And this is how the shit went down. The Indians that were half blood of war was not taxed. It's called the Sticker Act of 1947. I'm sure you're familiar with it because we all fight over that shit, right? But if you were less than a quarter blood, I mean one half, and if you were a freedman, there were no protections over your land whatsoever. So the new counties, the new cities, the state could pass tax laws and tax your properties and eventually get it from you. And they did it like you wouldn't believe. It. And with the freedmen, there was also, you know, I was going to tell you about what niggerizing meant. Oh, I know you're Well, this is really juicy. <laughs> it was a term used by oil and gas speculators on freedmen allotments who geologists had recommended that there was oil under their land. And what they would do, they would go knock on these doors, and particularly in the 1930s, 40s, 50s, and 60s, and basically say, uh, well, we just want to drill on your land. You just got to sign this, and we'll give you this money. And they would say, oh, Granny said never to sell her land, or Grandpa said no sell his land, whatever. And it's not for sale. And they would take out this wad of money, all $1 bills, rolled up, 400 with a hundred dollar bill wrapped around it. And you ain't got no floors on your house, and you're starving in the winter, and your kids ain't got coats and shoes, that money looks really good. Those people literally call that nigga right. And it often worked to get them to sign or put an X, which was crazy if you believe that people would actually put an X down. And they got away with it. They got away with it. We have, we have literally families here in Tulsa that have benefited from Freeman allotments, particularly around the Tulsa area, for decades. And yet, those allotments never benefited the Freeman or the Indian, who actually were the first deed holders at all, period. And uh, we're supposed to not have a conscious for it that that type of wrong could not go unspoken or we can't do anything about it, which is why the state is afraid of McGirt. Because McGirt doesn't deal with just criminal issues. It doesn't say that. It deals with the jurisdiction of what's law over Indian people on Indian land. Criminal and civil. My own great-great-grandmother, whose allotment was down near Henrietta, had Door exit. In 1974, that paper down there in the Henrietta area ran a probate thing, including my name. I was living there. My parents, their, my dad's brothers, sisters, their kids, all looking for all the heirs of Susan Grayson. 
We didn't even know Susan Grayson down the lot. We thought because she died so early, she died in 1800. She was on the trail of tears that she didn't get it a lot. But we didn't understand that if you were living January 1st, 1898, you got on the lot. You could die January 2nd. You still got a lot because you were alive on the first day of it. Your heir was supposed to have gotten the land. Well, she got it and none of her folks knew about it. And so a guardian was placed over her land and he willed it to his kids who willed it to their kids who kept willing it to their kids and finally somebody figured out that this is illegal in 1874 and so they ran a probate to cover their tails and then the state ironically once they figured this crap was going to be going on a lot passed some crap saying that you can't deal with this issue if it's over 15 years old because we're now talking about something happened in 1905 10, 1910, 1920, whatever. And on the McGirt, there's no statute of limitation. That's what they're bringing. Anyway. All right, I can go on. You know, it's, it's the flip side of the danger of the not challenging when people are talking about sovereignty and I know what they're talking about. I'm a big fighter of tribal sovereignty, but only when we're talking about sovereignty that is responsible in treating everybody right, not uh, protecting some bullshit of some chief who wants to do something bad. That's what we have to learn. You know, in the Creek Nation, here's one of the issues. Um, you got to be a quart of blood to run for office in the Creek Nation. We have a tribal population of 94,000. 85, 90 percent is less than a quart of blood can't run for office. Only the people who could run for office are the ones writing the laws, hiring the attorney generals, appointing the judges, all of that shit. And so it's not a republic because there's no, it's like a kingship type of thing, a royalty type of family. You know, even though we elect you, but you're the only one we can elect. We can't put anybody else in that pot to do. The Cherokees got rid of that antiquated system. And so anybody can run in Cherokee Nation. But in Creek Nation, we're stuck in these antiquated ways of black ones. Uh, but it goes down to, um, I mean, that you have to have an ancestor on, on their by blood row. And you have to prove that that's your ancestors do uh, birth certificates and death certificates and legal documents and stuff like that. And oftentimes in the, particularly in the Choctaw Chickasaw Nation, and even the Cherokee Nation, the Freeman role, unlike the Freeman role in the Creek Nation, was based on a drop of African blood. You could have been a full Indian with a drop of African blood and you were placed on the freedom road in the Choctaw Chickasaw and Cherokee Nation. In the Creek Nation, it went back to the chattel slavery thing. You know, so you did end up on the by blood road, a third of the by blood world being people of African descent. But in the Choctaw Chickasaw and Cherokee Nation, the one drop rule applied, and if you were black, you were placed on the freedom road. And so you end up with a lot of Indians on the Freedom Road and, and with very little African ancestry. Even in the Cherokee Nation, when we have our uh, Freeman meetings, uh, when we were dealing with the Freeman case, I was shocked how many white people showed up that were Cherokee Freeman. Did you hear what I said? 
Back in the day, granted, granted, and grandpa passed. So he ended up just marrying white folks because he, he just had a drop that made him end up on the Freedom Road. You know, because that was the law of the day back in those days. And unfortunately, in the Cherokee and Choctaw Nation, uh, like the Cree Nation, there needs to be a lot of political pressure from Congress, from the state, from churches, from whoever, from artists, people in the art. Uh, pressuring tribes to do right by their people. I often say this, in the Creek Nation, when black people hear the word freedom, people hear the word sovereignty, they don't think it's a good thing. They hear the same thing black people in Mississippi heard in the 1960s when I was a kid, state rights. That shit didn't play well. And so that's what black folks hear when they hear sovereignty in the Creek Nation, it means state rights. We have a right to put our knee on your damn neck. And so, how do we make sovereignty a good thing? You know, where, where is the good of it? And there's a lot, but it needs to be shared equally with everybody and not based on race, but based on political status of being a tribal member, period. You know, so, uh, you decide to prove you have our ancestors on their blood rolls. As soon as you find one on their freedman roll, they're gonna deny it. But Cobra Franklin was a Chickasaw freedman. Excuse me, Choctaw freedman. His father, David, was a Chickasaw freedman. His mother was a Choctaw freedman who was owned by uh, Peter Pitchell, who was a Choctaw chief, prominent Choctaw chief back in the day. That's Buck Cobra Franklin. John O. Franklin, who comes here all the time, his folks are Choctaw freedmen and Chickasaw freedmen. Nobody ever talks about it, you know. So uh, our captain of the police here, what's his name? Wendell Franklin, same family. You know, but can't, can't get that brother to talk about that shit. You know, so the other part of it is that the tribes have such power in how they wield their money. I mean, with, the, with that Cherokee case that we had going on, Cherokee Nation spent almost $32 million kicking out their black folk. They could have just gave everybody to share that shit. You know, no, they spending that on attorneys in Washington, D.C., who knew it was a deplorable issue, but they were making money. And as long as the Cherokees were willing to pay the money, they were gonna take it, no one they were gonna lose anyway. $32 million to kick their blacks out. Yeah. So, you know, and, and the attorney for the Cherokee Freeman hasn't even been paid. That brother has got a penny for every thousand dollars he's actually owed. His name is John B. And he did an astounding thing. And we had a lot of crap that ended up turning for the Freeman when Obama got away. And then we had Eric Holder started fighting for the Freedmen. Then we had the Congressional Black Caucus with John Lewis and Maxine Waters and Diane Watson and people like that started fighting for the Freedmen. Matter of fact, Maxine knows Diane Watson going around saying she was a Freedman. We hated to tell her she wasn't. <laughs> she wasn't. <laughs> she started telling people she was descendant of Pocahontas. We were like, oh my God. <laughs> Anyway, whatever. <laughs>